This morning we are in the book of Ephesians. Um, I'm sure that will appear behind us shortly. Ephesians chapter 2, and I believe I wanted to read verses 1 through 10. Is that right? <laughs> Sometimes I forget to make a note to myself. But our text this morning is going to be those very famous verses in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Let me uh, read beginning in verse 1 of Ephesians 2. Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as the result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Let me just draw your attention to the verse 10 that reminds us that we are not saved by our good works, but we are saved in order that we might do good works Good works is the evidence that we have been saved, that we actually have trusted Jesus Christ and received the grace of God. But we are saved by grace through faith alone and not on the basis of our works. That's something we really do need to emphasize when we're talking about the evidences that we're saved. But, uh, you know, the fact that we're saved by grace through faith alone but when we're talking about being saved by grace through faith alone, we need to emphasize somewhat the fact that there will be those evidences. There will be a change of life. You don't just trust Jesus, get saved, and go on living an ungodly life. The Lord has no rebellious children. He has obedient children. Yes, there are times when we will fall into sin, but the pattern of our life will be obedience. Well, this morning we are looking at one of the most important teachings of Scripture, as you can imagine. And it's one of those teachings that separates the true church from the false church, from those who are truly saved to those who only think that they are saved. And that is that salvation, and, and in this case, we're looking at it narrowly, because salvation can be very broad. It can include everything that has to do from the time that you know, you're actually trust in Jesus to the time you arrive in heaven and throughout eternity. We're looking at it more narrowly, at that declaration of God that you are in fact just, which means that you are no longer liable to punishment in hell, but rather you have gained access to heaven through grace in Christ. So we're looking at that, and that you receive that justification or that salvation by grace alone, that this is entirely the work of God. It is something freely given uh, by him to whomever will receive it by faith. The Bible says that we contribute to this absolutely nothing. And that if you try to contribute, as it were, to the perfect work of Jesus Christ in salvation, you actually destroy his work. You destroy grace. You pollute it with your own works. Grace, by definition, is something that is freely given. Something that you cannot buy, something that you cannot work for, something that cannot be deserved. It's not what is due to you. It is something that is freely given. That is what grace is. 
Now, sadly, in the history of the church, there are so many who did not understand this. There were so many who, even having heard it, did not accept it, who believed still that there was something that man had to contribute to this work of salvation in order to be saved. I mean, there are some who believe that it has everything to do with you, that on the day of judgment, that this judgment of our works is really to determine whether or not you did enough good works to be justified in the sight of God. Some believe it really has to do with God weighing your good works and your bad works. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, then he's going to receive you into heaven. Some believe that you need faith to be saved, but they add to it other things like the sacraments, that you must receive God's grace through the sacraments that are ministered to you by an ordained priest in order to be saved. So they add the work of the priest. Some believe you can't be saved without baptism, that baptism is what actually saves you. There are denominations based on that. And actually, it's, become, it's gotten to the point where um, they're even accepted as Christians. Others say that, yes, we're saved by grace through faith, but once we come into the kingdom of God, we have to maintain that salvation by doing X amount of works, whatever that is, to stay saved. There are even those that turn faith itself into a work that you do. Abraham believed God. We just read in Romans chapter 4, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. And they believe what that means is that God was so pleased by the faith that Abraham showed that he looked at that faith as Abraham's righteousness, and that is what saved him. I've heard that taught, even in one of the institutions that I attended. The righteousness you need to enter into heaven comes by your act of faith. But what we're going to look at this morning is the fact that salvation is entirely of grace. It's not something you can work for. It's not something you can add to. It's not something you can maintain. It's something you can only receive. Now, we're going to look at four things. First of all, that salvation, again, in terms of justification, that declaration by God that you are just in his sight is purely by grace, grace alone. And that, it, secondly, for it to be by grace alone, it has to be received by faith alone. There is no other way. Uh, thirdly, that the reason that God has done it this way is because this is how he must do it if we are to be saved, based upon the fact that he is righteous and based upon the fact that we can do nothing. And then fourthly, because this is true, you and I cannot take any credit for our salvation. All the glory goes to God alone. So first of all, let's consider that salvation is purely by God's grace. I don't think that Paul could have said it any uh, more, clear, or clear, or more clearly than he has. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. Now, I want you to notice the key words that he uses here. By grace not of yourselves, the gift of God, not as a result of works. Now, grace, as I've already told you, is something that is freely given, something that can't be earned, something that can't be merited. It is unmerited favor. It is given to those who do not deserve it. As a matter of fact, in Scripture, it is most often given to those who deserve just the opposite. Because what is it the Bible says that you and I really deserve for the things that we have done, even the things we think that are good? Well, there are many people who believe that they deserve heaven. That again, the idea that God's going to weigh my works and my good works are going to outweigh my bads, and so God should let me in because I've done more good works than bad. But the problem with that is they're absolutely wrong. God is not going to let them in because their good works are going to outweigh their bad because, for one thing, they have no good works. The Bible says that you've only done bad from the time you've entered into the world. We already read in Psalm 51 where David talks about the fact that he was conceived and born in sin. 
that is the way we all came into the world. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, there is none good, there is not even one. There is none who seeks for God. He goes on to say in Romans chapter 5, verse 18, that because of Adam's sin in the garden, we were all condemned and we all deserve hell. I've already mentioned earlier that in God's eyes, all of our good works are like a mound of filthy rags. What he means by there are filthy menstrual rags. Abomination to God. Paul talked about his own good works once he was saved. What I accounted gain, I have considered loss for the sake of Christ. I consider it a mound of dung or refuse. That's what my good works were, Paul says, prior to coming to Christ. And the reason is that regardless of what we do, even when we do what is right, at least outwardly, we never do what we do for the right reasons. We never do it out of a love for God. We never do it out of a desire to give glory to Him. Now we do once we do trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, but not perfectly. But certainly, being unconverted, not trusting in Jesus apart from His grace, we have no love for Him at all. And so we cannot do anything that is pleasing to Him. The Lord actually tells us that as far as heaven is concerned, even if we just committed one sin, one sin is too many. Because you have to be perfect to enter into heaven. But the Bible says our entire lives have been a continual act of sin and rebellion against God. So do your works actually deserve heaven? Will your good works outweigh your bad works on the day of judgment? The Bible says we all deserve only judgment. We deserve only hell. And so if God is going to give you salvation, it has to be purely by his grace. And that's what Paul means when he says, it is not of yourselves. I mean, look at what he says in Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You walked according to the course of this world. You all uh, formerly lived in the lusts of your flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh. You were by children nature of wrath. I mean, what do you see in here that's going to ingratiate you to God? Why should he give you salvation based upon that? Now, what is it that changed? Was it suddenly that you began doing X amount of good works? God looked and said, wow, that's, that's interesting. And then he saved you because of those good works? No. It says, but God, being rich and mercy, because of his great love, even when we were dead, made us alive. It is the gift of of God, not as the result of works. So it is purely by grace. Now the second point needs to be emphasized so that you understand what it means that salvation is purely by grace. Since you can't work for your salvation, since your works are meaningless to God and worse than meaningless, they're actually sinful and wicked in his sight like a mound of dung or like a mound of minstrel rags. It has to be by grace and it has to be received by something which is not a work. It has to be received by faith. And notice that that's exactly what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now we do need to understand here that I'm not backpedaling on what I said earlier. That faith is the one thing that you must do in order to gain salvation. That salvation is, after, is, is by works after all, by this act of believing. Well, no, it isn't that way if you understand what faith is. If you see faith as something you do, as an act that is so pleasing to God that he considers that to be your righteousness, then you are looking at faith as a work and not as what it really is. I mean, what is faith? What is Paul talking about here? Well, faith by definition is an act of looking away from yourself, looking away from your good works, from your righteousness, from any worthiness in you, and looking to another for their good works, looking to another to do what you cannot do for yourself. In this case, it is looking to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 
Now, you're not saved by that act of looking to Jesus Christ. You were saved by Jesus Christ. What I mean by is this, that faith is the way that you receive what Jesus Christ has done. And you apply it to yourself. When you look to Jesus Christ, to his righteousness, and to his work, you are looking away from your works, from everything that has to do with you, and you are looking at everything that has to do with him. You are looking at his merits, at his works, at his righteousness, at his atonement. And you are receiving that which he offers to you. That's what faith is. Now, Jesus alone has done what is necessary to save you. Jesus alone lived a life that is pleasing to God. Jesus alone offered a sacrifice that is acceptable to God, the only sacrifice that can take away your sins. And he is the one who offers himself to you in the gospel if you are simply willing to look to him and trust him to save you. The Bible says that if you will do that, he will save you. He will do it freely. There's no cost involved. The only way that salvation can be by grace, the only way that it can be a gift freely given by God is if it is received by faith. If it is received by this looking to Jesus Christ alone to be just in the sight of God without adding anything else to the equation, no works, because works destroy grace. So faith is the act of looking away from self to another in order to save you. It is not the act by which you were saved. God's not pleased, as it were, so pleased by that act that he considers you to be just because you've done it, but rather by your looking to Jesus Christ and receiving all that he has done to save sinners. By that righteousness you receive, God declares you to be just. And that's what Paul meant when he said, God justifies the ungodly. Because personally, you will still be, have, you'll basically be the same person, except, of course, the Lord has put his grace in you and transformed your life, but you still have all this guilt, and there's nothing you've done to ingratiate yourself to God. But because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to you freely to clothe your nakedness, and because he's removed from you every spot and wrinkle and blemish of your sin through his atonement, you stand before the Lord perfect, even though personally you're still far from perfect. In God's eyes, in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are perfect. <clears throat> now, there is one more thing you need to understand about faith that proves that it is not a work that you can do to save yourself, and that is the fact that faith itself is the gift of God. You were not born with the ability to believe. Here's another error that is in the church, the idea that God offers Christ to all men. Certainly that's true. But that everyone has the ability to receive him at will. The Bible says that we cannot trust in Jesus Christ in that way, that we need the gift of faith to be able to do that. Jesus tells us in John 6, verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Now the thing is, flesh is what we are when we come into the world. We have nothing more than a principle of flesh within us, which is hatred against God. The Bible says we were born dead in our trespasses and sins. We've just read about that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. That those who are in the flesh, Paul says, cannot please God because they can't submit to him because they hate him. And because of that, Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 20, they will never come to him. No matter how many times Jesus Christ is offered to one who is in the flesh, they will never receive him. And that is exactly the way you were coming into the world. God must give you faith or you will never believe. And I believe that that's wrapped up in what Paul says in, again in our text. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now there's a debate here. When Paul says that that is not of yourselves, is he talking about the salvation? That's certainly true. 
The grace, that's certainly true. But what about the faith? Is the faith the one thing that is of yourself and the other things aren't, seeing that faith is that by which you receive Christ and that by which you're going to be saved and apart from which you cannot be saved? No, that faith is wrapped up in the whole package, especially when you consider what the Bible says about our condition coming into the world. We can't trust in Jesus Christ with our whole heart when we're dead in trespass and sin. We need to be changed. We need to be transformed. Even the faith that is necessary to receive the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ is not from you. It is the gift of God. Think about what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. In that very familiar verse in Jeremiah 13, verse 23, it talks about our inability to change anything physical about ourselves. Can we change the color of our skin? Can a leopard change his spots? Well, neither can you who are accustomed to evil do what is good. You see, it's not within our ability. It's not within our nature. The Lord needs to change our nature. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. You must be born again by the water and of the Spirit before you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. God's Spirit has to change your heart before you can enter the kingdom of heaven by faith. So faith is not a work that saves you. Faith is looking to Jesus Christ to save you. Faith is not something you can even exercise or, or do on your own. It is the gift of God. Salvation or justification is all of grace. And it is received by faith alone, that it might be by grace alone. Now, thirdly, the reason why the Lord has done it this way is because he has to do it. He, he's the only one who can do it. He's the one who had to take care of the problem that separated us from him because he's the only one who could. God is just. God cannot overlook sin. Some people say, why can't God just simply say, well, I'm just going to forget what you've done and just receive everyone into heaven? Well, God can't do that because he's just, because he's holy because he loves righteousness, because the sins that have been committed have been committed against him, and he is infinitely holy, and he is infinitely angered by that sin, and there is nothing he can do about that because of his nature, because he loves righteousness. He can't change from that to something he is not. And so if God is going to receive us to himself, he has to do something about the sin problem, and that's exactly what he does by sending his son into the world. In order to let someone into heaven, that person has to be perfect. That person has to have done everything right and nothing wrong. But we don't fall into that category. We haven't done that. We've done everything wrong. We've done nothing right. God cannot let us in on the basis of what we've done. So if he is to receive us into heaven, he has to do something to make it possible. And that's exactly what he did by sending his son into the world to stand in the place of his people as far as the obedience to obey God perfectly, to die on the cross for his people, to discharge their sins. That was the only way that God could have done it, and he was the only one who could have done it. If salvation is going to come, it has to be by grace. There is no other way. God has to do it or it can't be done. And God not only had to do it, he had to do it, of course, by himself. It had to be by grace alone. And it had to be received by faith alone. Because you and I can add absolutely nothing to salvation. We can't save ourselves. We can't contribute anything to our salvation. If we are to be saved, the Lord has to do all of it. It couldn't have been any other way. God had to plan it. He had to send his son into the world to accomplish it. He had to send his spirit into the world to change your heart so that you would receive it. Salvation is by grace. It's a free gift. It has to be received by faith. That's the only way it can be by grace. 
And it had to be this way because there was no other way it could be done. Absolutely no other way. Now finally, this is why uh, Paul says you cannot take any credit for your salvation. He tells us again in verse 8 for by, and verse 9 as well, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, do you know how irritating it is when, you know, you're, you're, even as a Christian, you're seeking to do things that are honoring to the Lord. You're not trying to draw attention to yourself, but you're trying to give all the glory to God because that's what the Lord wants you to do. Not to work to draw attention to yourself, but rather to draw attention to him. And then something you have done, since you're not drawing attention to yourself, since you're not you know, tooting your own horn, as it were, somebody else comes along and takes the credit to themselves. And they say they did it instead of you. Now, you know how irritating it is when something like that happens. You know, we, we still have, of course, a good measure of pride, and we don't like it when somebody takes credit for what we've done. But that's exactly what we do to God when we try to claim any of the credit for our salvation when it is something that he has done completely by himself. Now, that's why God hates the addition of anything. I mean, it, the addition of anything destroys grace. Any works added to grace destroys grace because grace is something that must be freely given, and grace is the only way it can come. But it's also offensive to God. And when we add anything to grace, we not only destroy grace, but we offend God. So what happens when we add the sacraments to salvation and we say we need to have a priest ministering the grace through the sacraments to us? Well, that gives then the reason for somebody to boast and it destroys salvation, doesn't it? Because the priest is ministering and we're receiving. Something has been added. If salvation comes through baptism, then the one baptizing might be able to boast or the one who receives baptism might be able to boast because they did or received a work that actually secured a man's salvation. If the Lord saves us and then we have to keep up a certain amount of works in order to maintain our salvation or to stay saved, then in the end we can boast that we were able to do that. We kept up X amount of works so that we kept ourselves saved and we can pat ourselves on the back. But no, Paul says no one may boast. If faith is a work that anyone is able to do, that God will look at as our evangelical righteousness, then aren't we taking all the glory away from God and giving it to ourselves because we are the ones who believed and that act saved us? Now, certainly that would be the case if we believe that salvation came purely by our works, that we made ourselves good enough for God to accept. There are people who actually believe that in the history of the church. Pelagius was certainly one. Some would argue that Charles Finney was another. But if salvation is something that has been entirely planned out by God, accomplished by the one who is both God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not only applied, but also preserved by God the Holy Spirit, then who gets all the glory? It has to be God, and that is the way he has made it. No one can boast. God gets all the glory, which means you cannot add anything to salvation. So that's how it is. Salvation is entirely by grace, received by faith alone, so that God may receive all the glory alone. Now let's take just a couple of moments to apply this. What does this say to you who have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Well, it tells you that if you are to be saved, you have to look to Jesus Christ and to him alone. He is the only way of salvation. Now the Lord offers himself to you this morning through the gospel. All you need to do is believe. All you need to do is look to him. All you need to do is trust him, receive him, and you will be saved. The Lord says he will not only save you from 
guilt, he'll not only take away all of your sins and give you a perfect righteousness, but he will also save you from the power of sin. This is that, that evidence that comes in. This is where the good works come from. Where Paul goes on to say in verse 10, uh, after Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is something that God does in the lives of everyone he will save. He changes their lives. He will not only save you from the guilt of your sins that would have condemned you to hell, but he will actually give you the power to obey him. He will free you from sin. It won't be perfect freedom, although that's something you will certainly want, but it will be freedom nonetheless. That bondage of sin will be broken, and you will have the liberty for the first time in your life to do what is right because that is what you will want to do. You will follow the Lord. So this says, first of all, to those of you who haven't trusted Jesus Christ, trust in him alone. Don't think that you have to do X amount of good works before you can even come to Jesus. Don't think that you have to prepare yourself to receive the grace of Christ. The Lord says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, come to me now. If you see your need for me now, Jesus says, come, and he will receive you just as you are and he will clean up your life. So don't try to clean it up before you come to him. Come to him now. Now what about those of you who believe that there is something you need to add to the work of Christ? Something that is left undone, that somehow Jesus isn't enough, somehow I've got to do something to show my worthiness so God can accept me. Well, you need to remember what the Lord says. The Galatian Christians were taught by the Judaizers who were supposedly converted Jews that Jesus Christ isn't enough, that you need to be circumcised, and you need to observe the traditions or the law of Moses if you are to be saved. Now, Paul told them, if you believe that, if you fall into that error, you have fallen from grace. You have actually destroyed grace. You've fallen away from Christ. You're not even saved if you're trusting Jesus and circumcision, trusting Jesus and the works of the law. It has to be Jesus and Jesus only. You need to stop, stop adding anything to the work that God has done and begin trusting Jesus alone. Because we've already seen, you can't add anything to your salvation. You have nothing to add. You have a perfect work that Jesus Christ has done. All your works are imperfect. So what are you going to do to the work of Christ if you try to add it? If you have pure gold and you try to add something that is impure, you're only going to make all of the gold impure. Now, thankfully, we can't pollute the works of Christ. But we do destroy grace when we try to add our imperfect works to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has done it all. All you need to do is turn from your sins and trust in him alone, and he will save you. And that is the only basis upon which he will. If you bring anything else to him, he will not receive you. It has to be him alone. Now, finally, for those of us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and believe it is by, you know, by grace alone and received by faith alone, this tells us also one last thing. It tells you and me to stop worrying and begin trusting. Because the one who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. One thing that true believers uh, struggle with more than anything else, I think, is assurance. Am I going to make it to heaven? Am I saved? Now, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ and you're struggling with your assurance, then that tells us that you, you somehow do not see the work of Christ as being enough. Somehow you sense something is missing. I've still got to do something. I've got to complete it. And I don't know if I have enough of what it is I'm supposed to do. So I don't know if I'm actually saved. Well, this text tells you that Jesus, when he gives you salvation, gives to you a complete salvation. He gives to you a total package. He gives to you a perfect righteousness. He takes away all of your sins. 
And there is nothing that can ever take you away from him. If you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, you are in fact saved. And you will make it to heaven. Because God promises that all who trust in his son, he will complete that work. He will perfect that work in the day of Jesus Christ. You will not be lost. Jesus says, all the Father gives me will come to me and all he has given to me. I lose nothing. No one can take it away from me. No one can take any away from me. And Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing in the physical realm, nothing in the spiritual realm. Because God has a grip on us that can't be broken. So the doctrine of of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, not only, of course, means that salvation is a free gift and there's nothing we can do to add to it, but it also reminds us that when he gives us salvation, It is a complete and full salvation, one that really does save us. So once you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you will not be lost. You are saved forever. So let's learn from this to stop looking at our works as any kind of grounds for our salvation and look to Christ alone because he is the only one who can actually save us. If you place your trust in him and in him alone, you will be safe. And that is the only way you will be safe. Let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and, and let's ask that the Lord like graciously apply what we've heard uh, to us this morning. Again, as we need to hear it individually.